Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is my privilege to serve as the minister of this congregation, along with members and friends, children and youth of all ages and at all stages of life. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. All are welcome to this House of Hope. We are moved by all that is around us to serve our mission of embracing freedom of body, mind, and spirit, and of loving with our whole selves as we do our part to help heal the world. As we come together for worship, we are mindful of the many people who traveled here before us. We recognize and honor the Peoria people who created their lives on these lands long before we were here. The congregation is sustained by the care, gifts, and generous talents of our members and friends. If you'd like to make a financial gift, see the link in the chat or in the slide at the end of the service. And while we gather online for the sake of one another's health and safety, we also welcome guests and visitors. If you are new to this congregation, I invite you to help us get to know you. At the end of the service will be the link for our coffee hour on Zoom, and all are welcome to the conversation. If you'd like to get to know more about the congregation, please drop us a line to the church website. And for this moment, I want to add a note of thanks to Nancy Taylor uh, for providing our decorations for the pulpit this month. Uh, we really appreciate that help. And I have a special announcement. Uh, in two weeks, on March 21st at 3 p.m. Central, we will celebrate my installation as the minister of this congregation. All are invited to the Zoom room. We have plenty of seating in there. The service will include elements that are recorded ahead, but also will record, uh, include a small number of people who are live in the sanctuary. And it will be filled with music, messages, and gifts from people from the congregation and from all over the country. If you attend any online service this year, this is the one. I hope to see you there. And now, let us enter into worship. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us in prison, circle for release, circle for the planet, circle for its all, for the children of our children, keep the circle whole, circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned, circle for Circle for 
Our opening words are This Promise That We Make by Reverend Gretchen Haley. It starts here, in this moment, in this breath you feel rising in your chest, this beat building between us, the healing, the hunger, the hope, the courage, the calling, the commitment, the drawing out of a new day. It begins now, in the imagination, in this story we weave together, this song we sing, this prayer we bring into being from our hearts to our lips, from our hands to our lives, our shared life, it starts here with praise and thanksgiving, forgiveness and this humble centering confession that we could be wrong. This promise that we make to keep learning, to keep trying, to keep our sense of humor, to keep close this knowing that we are all in this together. Come, let us begin. Come, let us worship together. Our chalice lighting is from the Reverend Suzelle Lynch. Each time we light this chalice, we renew our commitment to our Unitarian Universalist faith. With the spark of this flame, we make it new again. With the spark of this flame, we make it new again. As fresh and as surprising as the first day we encountered the spiritual community and realized we were home. Good morning. We gather together today as Unitarian Universalists to better understand our role as a liberal religious people. To that end, I have a simple lesson to share with you all that might help. Some of you may know that in the old Christian Bible story, a little boy named David brought down the giant Goliath with five smooth stones. Well, as religious liberals, we have five smooth stones of our own, and we use our five stones to build a more just, loving, and free world. Our first stone says learning. Unitarian Universalists believe that there is always more truth to learn that there's always more that we can know and discover about ourselves, our world, even about religious truths like God. There is always more to learn. Our second stone says free. Unitarian Universalists believe that we are free to believe in things. That means that just because someone says something is true doesn't mean that we have to believe them. We are free to decide with our minds and hearts what is true, and we choose the things we believe in. We are free. Our third stone says community. Unitarian Universalists believe that it's important to build community that whatever we believe, building relationships and being part of a community is an important way to live out our values. Community matters. Our fourth stone says work. Unitarian Universalists believe that it's important to do the work of justice. Good things don't just happen. People like you and me work to make them happen. And our fifth stone says hope. Unitarian Universalists believe that it is important to have hope. That even when things are hard and sad, 
we must continue to have hope and to act and live in ways that are hopeful. This lesson of the five smooth stones of liberal religion comes out of the roots of our UU living tradition, roots that have been growing for centuries. Even though we also know that new ideas and understandings are still being revealed every day. It is through these roots that we are able to grow and through us that our UU tradition continues to grow in the world. So be it. Heschel, he says, from the Jewish scholar Abraham Heschel, he says, prayer invites God to be present in our lives and in our spirits. Prayer cannot bring water to a parched land, nor mend a broken bridge, nor rebuild a ruined city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. In this time of the service, we gather for our joys and sorrows, the prayers of the community. And in this moment, I want to offer that we send wishes for a complete and speedy recovery for Mary Mulholland Kafar, who is recovering at home following surgery. And we also offer our healing wishes to Rob Renner, who is challenged with health issues and has had a recent hospital stay. Let us hold before us all of the names, the milestones, the joys, the sorrows, all that it lives in our hearts and is around us. There's far more than we can possibly name in any one moment, but we can hold all of this that is with us. We can hold all of this together. I invite you to join me for a moment of quiet, for reflection, for prayer, even if you will. Let us hold this space together and breathe. Amen. The reading is adapted from a longer work by Reverend Jude Geiger. James Luther Adams was a mid-20th century theologian, minister, and academic from the United States who lived in Germany in the 1930s and was active in the clandestine resistance to the rise of Nazism. We often take our theologians out of context. And as I talk about his thoughts, keep his experience in Germany in mind. After the breadth of his 40 plus years of writing were complete, folks started pulling together bits and pieces of his thinking, jumbled them together, and came up with some pretty helpful combinations. One such is an essay on the five stones. It's a metaphor back to David and Goliath. In the Jewish story, a teenager, David, manages to defeat the giant named Goliath on the field of battle with a sling and five stones. It's a violent story, but a course of action that prevented two armies from colliding. There was one death instead of thousands. From James Luther Adams, the five stones became a metaphor for how we can combat systems of oppression in the world. What are the five things we can do that will unbind the oppressed? In modern language, how do we end racism, homophobia, classicism, and misogyny, to name a few? What does our liberal faith say about living? I will paraphrase the much longer piece, which itself is an edit of a sort, using language that might be more familiar to us. One, revelation is not sealed. In the unfolding of the human spirit, we continuously experience life in new ways, and so too does our experience of truth. 
Two, relationships between people ought to be free. Mutuality and consent are both ethical and theological principles. Three, we have an obligation to work toward creating a beloved community. Our faith inspires us to the work of tra transformational community that is centered in justice and love. The prophethood of all believers has a corrective effect on systems of oppression. Four, each child that's born is another redeemer. We are all potential sources of good in the world and each have a role to play. Goodness happens in relationships with one another. Five, we choose hope. Our resources, both sublime and mundane, hold all the capacity we need to transform the world. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the birds they tell us. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the trees they tell us. We're here to be lifted in love. To listen to love as a flower raises its face to the sun. We are all one here to be lifted in grace and love. We are here to be lifted in love Look at the sky, it tells us We are here to be lifted in love Look at the trees, they tell us We're here to be lifted in love To listen to love As the children raise all their faces to we are all one here to be lifted in grace and love. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the trees they tell us. We are here to be lifted in love. Look at the seas they When we declare ourselves in the world, it behooves us to have a sense of our essential values and their origin. For it is from our foundations and our positions that we launch ourselves into our lives as they are and our future as it might be. This month's theme is commitment. And as we head into my installation as the minister with this congregation, it seems appropriate uh, to say something about the nature of our commitments in Unitarian Universalism. Now, one of the uh, points I, I sometimes hear, given the liberalness of this particular tradition, is that one can believe anything you want. That can be one of the shorthands. So what I will offer at the outset is that while there is an enormous amount of freedom uh, to discover and to articulate and, in fact, to believe and practice, and we don't ask that people sign to any one particular articulation of faith, there are, in fact, things commonly held among us and core theological concepts and core motivations to which we are called into the world. For today, I want to tell a story about some of those core beliefs, uh, some of those essentials in religious liberalism, uh, in particular, those articulated from 
James Luther Adams in the 20th century, um, and a little bit as applied to today. And Adams, I'll offer, is a Unitarian Universalist theologian who lived through the major events of the entire century. He was born in 1901 and died in 1994, so he saw the span of that age. So Adams, in his professional life, in particular was uh, engaged with the world uh, in the 1920s and, um, and, as I said, through the entire span of his life. He was an academic, a teacher, a minister, a friend, a storyteller. And in fact, his method of instruction came from his writing and his telling stories to students and to anyone who would listen. Um, in his language, Adams can be uh, wonderfully dense in his cultural, philosophical, theological references. And his style is much more narrative than systematic. So you need to kind of read and understand and read and understand. And much of his writings were also transcripts of what he talked about as well. So people have been exploring and interpreting him for his whole life and beyond. His students and those of us who follow him, uh, you know, read him and, and can hear the warmth of his voice as well as the depth of his spirit and his concerns, particularly around liberal religion. So let me take a moment to talk about the nature of liberal religion, courtesy of my colleague, Reverend Erica Barron. Now, the word liberal is not referring to political liberalism, although certainly Adams draws a connection between social liberalism and religious liberalism. What we're talking about is the most radical part of the Protestant Reformation, where folks said that all hierarchy in religion is inappropriate, that reason should be used in the interpretation of scripture, and that all people should have the right to read and interpret scripture for themselves and follow their individual understandings without a threat of religious persecution. Now these folks, these reform, reforming folks, would give rise to universalism and Unitarianism in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and although that's not the exclusive, we're not the exclusive uh, results of that legacy, there's many other faiths who also take up that spirit in a lot of different ways. Now, one of the major critiques of liberal religion is that it has an enormous amount of ideas and thinking and takes into account a lot of different sources, but that it doesn't, uh, liberal religion doesn't necessarily have a lot of impact or the impact that it could, uh, doesn't engage in a lot of action uh, as a result of all this exploring and thinking. That professing a liberal religious approach to theology uh, works well when talking about uh, art and science and engineering and social ideals and simply making meaning. But being a part of a liberal religious association, a congregation, doesn't necessarily always demand that much of our lives and actions, that we can enjoy being in the community, but not always necessarily put doing something that really changes the world. Adams was concerned that liberal religious bodies did not act on their beliefs. He kept searching for people who would, as he put it, take time seriously, that they would pay attention to the world and act for our collective liberation, for everybody's freedom of spirit. Now, he started in a terribly strict and conservative family. Um, give a little more background here. It was a hell and damnation kind of faith with very little joy. And Adams eventually lost his father's faith and then rejected religion entirely. In fact, for a while, he thought his purpose was to deconstruct and dissolve religion whenever possible. Ironically, he was doing this in divinity school, which was kind of interesting. Um, 
And while in divinity school, for this purpose of learning about religion so he could take it apart, a professor observed that Adam's actual purpose might be in the ministry. That observation kind of stopped Adams short, and what he realized was that he was engaging faith in an entirely new way, and eventually he became a Unitarian. What Adams also saw uh, shortly after kind of coming into his tradition here is the rise of the Nazis in Europe. And he was there in 1927, and then later in the 1930s, his hosts brought him to see the thinkers and critics of the day. Um, he also saw and heard from his hosts how the more liberal religious institutions held back from engaging with the rise of fascism. He was cautioned against speaking up even as early as 1927. There's a story of him getting into a heated uh, argument with someone who was participating in a pro-nationalism parade. And he was kind of engaged and enthusiastic in, in trying to convince this person uh, of his point. And in a moment, a few people grabbed him and pulled him out of the growing crowd. And they said to him, in about five more minutes, he would have been taken off the street and held and questioned and maybe not seen again. In his later visit in the mid-1930s, more than one conversation included the wish that liberal religionists had, in fact, gotten together and protested against what they had seen were the rising voices that led to, uh, that led to the Nazis and to Hitler. It wouldn't have taken much. They were lamenting and would lament for the rest of their lives. Adams came back to the United States and found people who were sympathetic uh, to these biases that were being promoted, um, found people who were indeed against uh, those who were immigrants, people of color, anybody considered less than white and physically healthy. But he also found people who weren't willing to get involved as well. And from those conversations, he could tell how great the risk of such mindset could be growing in this country. So that much of the rest of his life and work was dedicated to bringing his observations and his teachings and these discoveries to liberal ministers, to schools, to congregations, to anyone who would listen, in fact. And he lived long enough to provide an enormous amount of witness for multiple generations of thinkers and ministers. And we get the benefit of that legacy today. He was someone who, in his existential search for meaning, sought for real impact, for, as he says, taking time seriously. His was a continual effort to find thinkers and theologians and congregations, indeed entire faiths, to pay attention to this moment, to our immediate social context and all that was, uh, all that it implied. He lived this kind of journey that he continually espoused. Ralph Waldo Emerson reminds us that that which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for we are worshiping. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Our task is to take time seriously in the line of liberal religious thought, how the ideas and those of us who hold them might might be a force for shaping our world and for making a more just human community, a more just global community. You know, Adams had put together his thoughts in the first, earlier first half of our century uh, out of a deep concern for the lack of action from the progressive institutions he saw. And he said this could be different, that the liberal churches have both something to say and something to do. And he and other colleagues 
continued their study, educated others, brought these messages to the congregations. And those messages informed our Unitarian Universalism and how we showed up, and other faiths, and how we showed up in social movements, in civil rights, in women's rights, in lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning rights, in climate, and now uh, our current work in multiculturalism, anti-oppression, economic justice, and environmental justice. Our liberal religion today still struggles with uh, the primacy of the individual. We did such a good job in the Protestant Reformation of saying the individual search needs to be prioritized uh, that sometimes that, that really ends up being the first focus, uh, the first place that we move from, and sometimes the continual focus. We are still struggling with our ability, how to understand that our ability for agency and our freedom also has, lives in relationship. We are still working on prioritizing the needs and the, of, the, of the collective, of we, and what happens when we collaborate and work together. We're still sorting out how our effort has impact and a willingness, committing to a willingness to be uncomfortable and courageous and not have all the answers. So when we look at our liberal religious faith, are we asking those questions that say, does what we profess lead us into new information, lead us into critique, into letting go of what we thought was important and discovering how to create circles of care, of trust where we can be courageous enough to admit error and mistake and to hear when someone is in pain and not run from it. Where might we be vulnerable enough to grow in love of a muscular working compassion for ourselves and for others? Do we understand that we are the agents of putting faith in action? We have such an opportunity given the challenges of this past year. We have had to make difficult choices to stay away from each other as an act of love and care for individuals as well as our entire society. We have had to hear about more deaths of people of color, of black and of indigenous people and participate, choose how do we show up in the Black Lives Matter protests from last year and how we continue that work um, as we go forward. As we look into how, what does it mean to come together again? What does it mean to get a vaccine? What does it mean to have care? How can we learn from the lessons that said what was normal wasn't actually okay and healthy? for millions of our siblings on this earth. There's a new opportunity that opens before us. We have a chance to make room for all voices, for all stories. We are called to act to preserve democracy, to allow that everyone has a voice and a vote. And we do so we can do so in the recognition, in the profound recognition that we are a network of communities among communities, as Paula Cole Jones tells us. Perhaps one of the lessons we can learn, if we learn any one lesson and live forward, is how much each of us needs and relies on the other for our universal liberation individuals and by groups. How can we become more free, more whole, more compassionate, and bring more justice into the world? As Adams tells us, by their groups you shall know them. How shall this congregation be known? How shall we take seriously now, our today, and our future? How do we apply and live 
a liberal religious tradition. Our universe is ever-changing, and we are witness to it from our small respective corners. We are so much stronger when we choose to work together. And this work, this work is of liberation, to bring love in action and to bring it to everybody's lives. Because we know that the freedom of you know, each of us knows that my mind and my heart and my body is inextricably bound with yours. The freedom of our hearts and minds and bodies are inextricably bound. We have this opportunity. Let us embrace this time and this place. So let us go forth, receiving of the legacy we have inherited and the charge that we might go forward and live boldly into the good work of our ministry to be, in fact, this pilgrim church on an adventure of the Spirit. So may we go. Amen. Kirby Capo. Our time together is finished, but our work is not done. May our spirits be renewed and our resolve strengthened as we meet the challenges that are before us. This chalice flame is extinguished until we ignite it again in the spark of our community and our communion together. And from David Blanchard, do more than simply keep the promise made in your vows. Do something more. Keep promising. As time passes, keep promising new things, deeper things, vaster things, yet unimagined things. Promises that will be needed to fill the expanses of time and love. Keep promising. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs> 